welcome back to Spinning the Past. In my last video, I had mentioned that I'm reading this book. It's Spain's Golden Fleece, Wool Production and the Wool Trade from the Middle Ages to the 19th Century by Carla Ron Phillips. Um, this is an excellent book on the history of the merino wool. So we know that in the North American markets and usually the world markets as well, the merino is the number one wool breed out there. And it was indeed the golden fleece because it was so sought after. Merino is a very fine, it's one of the finest wools that exist. So people were really looking for a, a, a very soft, luxurious, fine, high quality, high grade wool. And that was the mer merino wool. And for centuries, the Spaniards had pretty much the world monopoly on it. Uh, but the time period of the book that this is uh, going through, the Middle Ages to the 19th century, and most of it is on the 18th century, some merinos are being shipped to, to the UK and uh, other places or around the world. But uh, the other places, I guess we're having some difficulty because if you read the book about the wool production, that there were, there were French coming in, there were English coming in, there were naturalists. They wanted to know how the sheep were, were raised so that they would be, that the sheep would be, I guess, uh, prosperous. I think they had some trouble with the fleece and with the sheep raising in these other countries. So they came to Spain to see how they did it, kind of like from beginning to end. The chapter I'm dealing with today is washing the fleece. Um, the chapters before dealt with how they actually raised the sheep and then the shearing process. And I could have started with that and I could start with the shearing process, which is really interesting and I will make a video, but because this season right now that we're in, at least for me, is wool washing season. And I know with the uh, shave them to save them, it's also sheep washing, wool washing season. And I just thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I could give a little report on that chapter on how they washed merino fleeces? You have to understand that there were there are millions and millions of pounds of wool that they're dealing with there back. Um, like I said, primarily this chapter focuses on the 18th century uh, from the Middle Ages, they were, they were, there were so many sheep, herds of 20,000 sheep, just a herd of 20,000 sheep. So that's a lot of shearing they have to go. That's a lot of wool processing. And I think if for modern uh, wool producers and, uh, and those who buy those fleeces, it's interesting to know how they perfected that, how the Spaniards perfected that. So the sh I'm gonna start now. The, um, the processing part that we're gonna start with is washing. And the book makes a division between the shearing is still part of the fleece wool sheep management. But now when we're talking about washing the fleece, the fleece is separated from the sheep. Now we're talking processing and that is part of the marketing part of the wool production and wool trade. So she, she, the um, sheep who were sheared um, early summer, by midsummer, they are, um, they are starting to take the fleeces to the washing stations. I don't speak Spanish, but it's lavaderos for washing stations, right? So there could be 400 to 500 of these washing stations in, um, in Spain. It consisted of a giant copper cauldron under which a fire would be kept, then rinsing troughs, and then a nearby clean field for drying. That's like the basics. And they said in here, soft water is the best. And those of us who fight with hard water know that soft water would be helpful to wool washing. So the shearing stations, which I'll talk about in another video, were, it could be seven to 10 miles, could be 40 miles, distance. So they had to shift the shearing, the wool stations, shearing stations, 
You had to shift all of that wool to the washing station. And there would be certain of these washing stations that would be used by some of the best quality wool producers. So those who had the largest flocks or, or the best quality would kind of designate this is the washing station. And usually it's because they had good water and good surrounding to, to process the fleece. The region, this is a quote, the region where a sack of wool was washed served to define the rate of taxes its exporter would pay. So the region, so they would be stamped, the wool sacks would be stamped. Okay. If wool was not sorted and sheared before it was sorted, the wool was stored and washed later. So in the previous chapter, they talked about the English would wash the, the sheep before shearing. And they made a, uh, an argument in that chapter before this that it was just not feasible for the merinos. The merinos wool was so dense, it wouldn't dry out. The animals would, I guess, freeze with all that wool, and it just didn't make a good final product. So the merinos were sheared dry, just as they were. Then they, the wool was washed. So in 1770, 1672, the government, Spanish government said, it's probably the crown, uh, that the wool must be washed at public washing stations, public. And if you wanted to wash your wool in rivers or streams, you would need a license for that. And the only exception was for personal household use. So you couldn't skirt around, haha, <laughs> that's a pun, you couldn't skirt around not using one of these giant um, washing stations. Uh, so in the late 17th century, um, there's three, these three different places, and I won't murder the places in my bad Spanish. They were told to scald the wool in hot water before washing it. So it was said to make the wool whiter and cleaner, but then they did an actual study, a test, to see whether that was true, and it wasn't true. So the traditional says, no, we don't need to scald it before we wash it. And so um, I guess the that's just, yay, one for the traditionalist team. We've been, they've been saying, like, we did it right. You know, it doesn't make a difference. We know how we're going to clean the fleece, and, and it's always worked. So hot versus cold water wash. Merino, of course, needs more hot water to wash because it uh, because it has more lanolin in it. And uh, Joseph Banks, who was who was tending or somehow related to the Merinos that were owned by the English monarch George III, quote says was difficult, if not impossible, to remove the lanolin by the English method. Of washing the sheep prior to shearing. So again he went to Spain because their methods of how they washed their English sheep did not work with the merinos. The compact and impenetrable coat of the greasy dense merino sheep um, meant that the merinos chilled easily and they were shocked by shearing or by cold. So after they were sheared, again, I'm kind of going backwards. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be handling that in another video, um, but the merino sheep are very susceptible to being chilled. And so even after shearing, they wouldn't be moved or anything until they could get a, um, acclimated to not having a coat on. So once they were sheared, the uh, flock owners would turn over the wool to the merchants to wash. So the flock owners are not the wool washers. They said that the um, that it could be like a month process to to pr process all the fleeces, um, and they would start with the best quality. So at the beginning of the day or the beginning of whatever cycle, how many days they were going to, on this batch, where they were going to spend out the best quality was done first. They said the hours are about 16 hours a day from pre-dawn to nightfall. And they would hire in people from the countryside to help because the 
uh, midsummer. There wasn't much farm work. There was no harvest. There was no planting. It was between stage, and then people could earn little extra money to help uh, with the wool. He talks that she, uh, in here. She talks about that the giant cauldrons were three and a half feet deep, three feet wide, and five feet long. And I'm going to show you a picture in here of what that might look like. So here's a shed, here's a cauldron, and then they had a fire underneath it. This is a top view, this little diagram. This is the cauldron. It would go in there and I'll tell you exactly how they did it. And then these are the rinsing little basins, I guess, and it would drain down here and then it would go and dry out here in the fields. So that's basically how that was done. So here are the stages. So the water was heated to an ideal 122 to 140 Fahrenheit or 50 to 60 Celsius. So that's actually maybe cooler than modern washers would use. That's cooler than I would use. The water had to be hot enough to soak the wool clean, but not so hot that it would remove all the lan lanolin and harden the fibers. So for them to remove all the lanolin was not preferable, that it would harden the fibers. And maybe they were fearful of what we called scouring. That's what you would do before you want it to die and you really had to get all the lanolin off. So they left some, they left some lanolin in, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the water temp was tested by a supervisor who waded his leg into that cauldron. That would not be my job to see if it was um, warm enough. If it was warm, it was okay. If it burned his leg, well, that's too hot. So again, I would not do that job. Workers added 1,000 pounds of wool, and I had to read that a couple of times. I'm, I'm hoping she's correct here. And it depended on the size, uh, the size of the vat, depending on the size of the vat. So that size of the vat was just one. Some of these were they um, were were massive. So a thousand pounds of wool at a time they had to do. You know, I'm I'm lucky if I can do one pound of wool at a time. So they did a thousand pounds of wool because they had up to a million pounds. That's one million pounds of wool that they had to wash. That's a lot. Notice here, right now, that there is no any surfactant. surfactant. There is no soap at all. There's, there's no soap, there's no lye, there's nothing in this process that I read, which I was kind of confused about because to get the lanolin and the dirt off, then uh, we rely on some sort of detergent or something to get it off and they did not so i don't know if their sheep were cleaner i don't think so it didn't read that they were necessarily cleaner they were uncoated but that's what they did um step three they would agitate the wool for several minutes so while it has a lanolin on you can agitate it in the hot water and then they let it soak for 20 minutes okay so far it's really similar to the way i wash wool then the wool was removed to baskets on grill work, and there's that grill work right there. And the water pressed through the holes in the bottom. I have something like that too. I have baskets that have holes in the bottom and it and I squeeze it out that way. Children with lifelines were dropped in there to kind of stomp on it and squish out that, that too. And I'm like, well, why did they have to have lifelines? But they didn't go on why the kids have to have lifelines. The dripping wool would be placed into woven baskets. It's not, I use a plastic kind of woven basket. And um, into the baskets, there were about three yards by one and a half feet. That's the diameter of these baskets. Then they would start the rinsing process. So they went from a hot, and then they had 20 minutes, and then they drained it, and they got the water out. And then for the rinsing, the rinsing part is they had a 2.5 foot
foot wide channel. There's your channel right there. Um, and they would put nets at the end of that channel for escaping wolves. Kind of like I put a steel sieve at the bottom of so it doesn't clog up my plumbing. Then fresh cool water from the stream at temperatures 63 to 64 Fahrenheit or 19 to 20 Celsius were poured in there. So that is their rinsing. That is the temperature of rinsing. I think my water might be a little bit cooler, especially in the winter it would be cooler here. But that kind of goes against what we've always talked about. Do not put from hot to cold because it will felt it. I didn't hear anything about felting, so I'm kind of curious and puzzled at the same time. Then they would um, drain that, and then they would take it to the nearby wedo meadows to dry, and it would be turned. For, they, took, they said it took four days for it to dry, so it's kind of the way I've done my wool. It's out on the patio, and I've had it out for several days, and I go out and I turn it, and you know, they had massive, massive, okay, if you're doing like a million pounds, that's a lot of wool to have to turn and dry. But again, they would hire you know, about 40 people to work for this, and then the kids and, and women could be out in the fields turning the wool. So um, it was really much part of everyone's job at that time. Um, and once dried, then it would be baled. Here, in 1791, it said there's a large one of these washing stations that washed 15,000 pounds of wool a day. And now the author didn't know whether that was pre or post washing because we know that in Merino, about 50%, somewhere around 50% of what would be lost would be lanolin and dirt. And so it would be lighter by that. So if that's 15,000 pounds of pre-washed, or is that post-washed? Um, and another station, she, the author mentioned, did 30,000 pounds. That's, again, you'd have multiple cauldrons there. This was a huge operation. And you can imagine why it would be 16 hours a day when you have to get through that. So to recap, you would soak the wool, agitate it a tiny bit in that hot water of 100 and 20 to 144 degrees, you would rinse that, and then you would rinse it in cool water. You would drain that, it would dry, and then you would bundle it. I just thought it was a really interesting process on how they washed the merino wools. And I think I have an idea that I might try this. I'm not sure I have much or any merino left. I'm not raw, that is. I have cormo for sure. I hesitate to destroy anything as, but, because the wools are expensive, but I might try that to see how that would work with a modern, in a modern context. To see what I would end up with. Would it be much too greasy, more greasy than I would like to use? I don't know. So the, the subsequent tractor chapters are going to talk about kind of the next stage. Um, like I said, all these were bailed. There were pictographs on there with the pictograph of the name of the washing station. Remember, washing stations like some are better and some are worse, kind of depending on the area of the country and who was running in and what sheep were going through there, the sh that kind of stuff. So so that was done, and all these stages has little pictograms on the big bales of wool. And then so the buyers would know, okay, this is a, a you know, the top quality, here's a second, here's a third quality. Um, oh, I know where this came. You know how we have right now where um, origins, we like to know the origin of a, a particular product. And it was kind of like that in that day, but it was much more specific what region that these wools were, were washed in. So anyways, I need to end this here, but I hope that you kind of enjoyed this little segment on washing fleece and I wish everyone happy wool washing. Yes, this is the end of summer and I have a lot of more wool to wash. Um, I like to get my wool done at this time of year because I can get them outside 
to dry in. Uh, you know, October's getting a little bit chilly and the leaves are falling on my stuff, so I've got, I don't have much time and I've got, as you know, I'm kind of by local right now, but, um, oh, I really like wool washing and I've learned so much just reading this book and I'm, I think I'm going to have to get a copy of this book for, for myself to have it as a reference because everyone knows Merino, everyone loves Merino, and Merino, 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 and to understand that wool from the, you know, from its production and the history behind it, it's just really, really fascinating for me, and I hope it's interesting for you. So again, um, thank you for joining the Spinning the Past, and I will catch you next time.